Today we're talking about the 2014 Taiwan Ceramics Biennale. Uh, and since its inception in 2004, the uh, Biennale has been an event that's eagerly awaited uh, by ceramicists, academics, curators and writers for the opportunity to participate in and experience its fresh and unique view on current ceramic practice worldwide. The museum's Biennale program of alternating a competition with a curated exhibition offers its audience an intellectually and visually stimulating examination of contemporary ceramic practice in the context of its rich permanent exhibits on the history of crafts of ceramics in the context of Taiwanese culture and history. As a major recurrent project of the New Taipei City Yinge Ceramics Museum, this event brings a focus to its collections and the opportunity to develop them, to develop them through acquisitions of accomplished and innovative works from the exhibition. The professionalism and intellectual rigour through which the theme and concept of the exhibition uh, is developed draws in artists, ceramic specialists and curators, offering many of them the opportunity to visit Taiwan for the first time and to experience its culture through the framework of its ceramic arts. I was invited to join the jury to select a curator for the 2014 Biennale, and with my jury colleagues, we considered seven strong curatorial proposals, presenting broad new views of current ceramic practice from around the world. Wendy Jer's proposal was selected for her exploration of new ceramic technologies in the context of contemporary art and design. Through its sub-themes, she made a persuasive proposal that explored a diversity of media not usually found in ceramic-focused uh, ceramic projects. By using these strategies to place ceramic practice into a broader discourse on the nature of production, Wendy encouraged the audience to consider the shifting centres of influence in ceramics. The works in the exhibition by artists from 20 countries collectively offered a new landscape of material culture, unfettered by geography or national tradition. Instead, overlaying on the familiar map of the world in fluid new network of ideas, interrogation and cultural perspectives, informed by new ways of making and communicating through the expanding new direction of ceramics. The participating artists have, have established practices from across the spectrum of ceramics, from individual craft studios to industrial settings, with a number of them drawing freely from globalised and interconnected technological and digital resources. Through their work in the exhibition, we were able to locate them as agents of change within a familiar material territory. The Biennale offers the museum alternative ways to engage its audience and to position itself as a leader in bringing new dimensions of art, craft, design and technology to the cultural landscape of Taiwan and the Asia-Pacific region. As jurors, we were able to appreciate how the new Taipei City Yinga Ceramics Museum achieves these objectives through its clear mission and its innovative program to energise the field of ceramics. Wendy Jer's proposal captivated the jury at the concept stage and I have great pleasure in inviting her, exhibition organiser Xu Ling Chiang, juror Jane Miloche, Jia Hua Liang and Elizabeth Perrell to, dis to uh, discuss this event. Wendy, thank, thank you. you. Mm. Thank you, Robert, and thanks to the organizers of this conference. It's great to be here. Um, I feel like we've sailed the seven seas together <laughs> <laughs> to be here. Um, our panel is, one of the, is a very diverse panel, um, and I thank all the members who've, who've traveled from far. Um, perhaps the, the first person to thank here is Xu Ling, who's the Taiwan Ceramics Biennale Coordinator at the Yinga Ceramics Museum. Um, and also Jia Ha Liang, who is an associate professor at Tainan National, sorry, Taiwan National University of the Arts, and who was a great um, assistant to, not, not assistant, he was an associate um, curator with me at the Biennale. We invited him to, to assist in the curatorial project. Similarly, Dr. Elizabeth Perrell from University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Can everybody hear me? Yes, okay. Um, acted as a consultant specialist in Zulu pottery for the Spianal. And lastly, um, Jane Milosh, who some of you have heard last night speak at the National Gallery of Art um, from the Smithsonian, who's head of the Provenance Research Institute. 
So those are our panelists today. We're going to try and whiz through this. I can't promise we'll make it in an hour. We're a very big panel, um, but we're certainly going to try. Shuling, over to you. Yes, I'm the, I'm the coordinator of the uh, Taiwan Surround Biennale, and it's very nice. Yeah. Is not, uh, is that okay? Yeah. Everybody hear me? Okay. okay, it's like it's my pleasure to collaborate with Wendy Girls for the uh, 2014 Taiwanese Arts Biennale. And uh, now I want to show my my museum for us. It's our new Taipei City in the Ceramics, uh, Ceramics Museum. I will divide it into three parts. And the one, uh, the first one is Ceramics Museum. Uh, it's, uh, it start from uh, 2000, and uh, ceramic part is start from 2008, and uh, uh, sign in our village is start from 2012. So it means oh, our museum is, is big, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, yeah. Now just on to the how we operate our museum, and it's, uh, also we have a marketing uh, department, uh, educational department, uh, exhibition department, and also we make a lot of exchange with up with uh, different kinds of uh, international institute, institute, for example, like IAC. So you can see the marketing. We we try to to build a local brand. In the wells, and uh, we have an educational department to to uh, to make a ceramics ac academy and uh, a lot of a residence program conference as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have an exhibition. It will be then you know the purpose of our exhibition later. Yeah. So our exhibition, of course, the main part you you will know is about uh, Biennale and international exhibition, and uh, uh, so. Uh, for our uh, uh, ceramic adec uh, uh, academy parts, I think everyone wants to know is about our uh, residence program. Now is you can you can download the, uh, our application form from the website of our museum. So welcome everyone to apply our residency program. Okay, At the end of our uh, the, our museum's exhibition program, you can see we have uh, five uh, five purpose of our our exhibitions. Firstly, we want to encourage contemporary creation. So we have a new type of city ceramics awards. It's for uh, our local Taiwanese artists. Uh, the, uh, the second one is Taiwan Ceramics Biennale. To uh, Taiwanese Ceramics Biennale is, is uh, for international ceramics. Uh, also, it divided two parts. And also, I will I will explain later. And uh, Thirdly, uh, we are uh, we encourage industrial products. So we have a creating living, a selected exhibition of a new ceramics work in Taiwan. Also, is also is related to our our local uh, uh, industrial products, and uh, we want to uh, encourage our local uh, local uh, ceramics design for this part. So that's the reason we hold this competition as well. And the, third, and the fourth thing, uh, we, have, we have to encourage young generation, so we will have a national contest on Chinese zodiac design. Yeah. And the, first, uh, fifth, the fifth is encourage ceramics artists and dealers. So we have a new type of city in the ceramics museum exhibition application. So everyone could, it's not only for the, our local artists, but also for the, the, um, the foreigner artists as well, so everyone could apply this uh, our our um, uh, ceramics museum exhibition application. You also you can download the application form on the website. Yeah, if you want to have a solo exhibition or museum, you can try to apply our solo exhibition application as well. Okay, now it's a TV, uh, TCB. Our in, in historical of, overview. It, that's uh, you can see for this one. through this uh, this paper is a work uh, competition. We divide it into two parts. It's work competition. Uh, you can see 2004. First, uh, 2000, uh, 2008, and uh, 2012, and uh, 2016. Uh, the is coming soon. Yeah. Uh, they, for this set is a world competition, and uh, we hold we hold a uh, curatorial competition 2010 and uh, 2014. And I saw 
as I see the curator of our 2010, Moira Elliott, Miss Moira Elliott, she, she's here. Yeah, her test. Yeah, thank you for her coming. <laughs> Correo, yes. So the best, uh, best practice of a TBC, uh, TCB is uh, we want to lead in the terms of innovative model structure and uh, methodologies uh, upgrade the practice for the International Ceramics Biennale and also we want to reflect contemporary ceramics tendency through our Biennale and so we want to take Texturalized Taiwan in ch within the international ceramics environment, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, of course that's the reason we cooperate with Jiahao for for uh, for the uh, for 2014 about Taiwanese ceramics uh, work into this uh, into the Vietnam, and uh, also we cooperate with neighboring regions, for example like Japan, Korea, and American China. And uh, uh, all of this, we want to just uh, try to look like, to try to present the Chinese artists with uh, uh, with a global globalization world. Is is that possible to present how how we can how the globalize and uh, and the localize in our in Taiwan? Okay, okay, the the. Best practice in our in the Biennale is uh, we want to make an innovative model. Uh, for example, international curatorial competition with two rounds, final international jury. We uh, uh, first round just uh, try to we we just call for the international field and uh, uh, to ask uh, international curator who can join our competition and. Uh, for this time, for 2014, we have 18, we have 18 uh, uh, proposal to submit for the 2014 Biennale, and finally we choose uh, eight, eight proposal to be our fin to, to to be our final uh, final selection, and also we we uh, we have a final international jury of seven members. It includes Joe Miroš, she's from Smithsonian Museum, and Robert Bell, and you know that very well, you know him very well. And our ask uh, SML of uh, uh, SML of our cultural ministry, uh, Chen Yushou, and also uh, one is uh, the famous uh, Japanese uh, ceramic artist Sisko Nakasawa -san, uh, San, San, uh, yeah. So it's our our member of uh, the, our um, uh, the member of our jury panel, and finally they decide uh, when it should be the winner of our 2014 Biennale, and uh, she will of course she will then you know the, the Biennale later, and also we have a corporate methodology to consult with uh, Elizabeth Perea and uh, associate curator with uh, Jia Hao Liang Jia Hao. Okay, is uh, the is our. Uh, Different kind of uh, events we hold for the Biennale, the T TCB opening, conference, workshop, and the cultural tour. Also, uh, for the Biennale, we also invite international to be our international artists to be our residence artists, uh, especially two from a uh, one is from French, France, uh, another one is from uh, South Africa for this this Biennale. That they got very wonderful uh, experience in our museum. And also, they in, it interact with interact with local culture very well. But uh, anyway, so just uh, so we want to not only we just want to select select pieces from everywhere. We want to make uh, the artists who can interact react uh, interact with our local culture as well. Okay. Now I I would like to, to know, let you know the future of our museum and the Biennale. Uh, so just announce our our Biennale. So Miss Biennale is coming soon in next year, and also we will we will hold uh, ISC in two thousand eighteen, and the title of the 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 ISC is already decided. It's already an earlier functionality functionality. Spiritual, spirituality and the diversity. Okay, you, you can see the date of uh, of the IAC. So.
So thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shuli. Um, and while we're welcoming esteemed guests, uh, Pip McManus, welcome. She was the Australian representative on the Biennale. Lovely to have you here. Okay, the next person that I want to call up is um, myself. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to uh, quickly present the Biennale. Um, which really aimed to present uh, key trends in contemporary international ceramics. And with that, um, as, as uh, Robert mentioned, um, I'm not interested in throwing out the baby with the bathwater. We had traditional craft, we had contemporary fine art, and we had ceramics in the, sort of the largest expanded field, and that included film photography, interactive pieces, um, sound pieces, etc., etc. Okay, what was this um, TCB project? I've created this little flowchart to, to explain what it involved. It was a very big project. It takes over two years to, to organize and plan. Um, I was pretty much working full time for, for over a year on this. Um, it starts with the international competition, and I've also sort of plugged into this diagram the presenters. So Jane Milosh, Robert Bell were on that international curatorial competition. Um, and then uh, my project involved 58 artists from 32 <coughs> countries. Parallel to the artists was a program of artists in residency. As Schuling mentioned, we had two French artists, a young couple of designers, and we had a South African artist, Andili Dialvani. Um, I worked with Dr. Jiha Yang, the, and as well as Elizabeth. We created a handbook, which you may have seen downstairs. The idea of the handbook was a, a new idea. Um, it's a small guidebook shaped book which speaks about the making of. Um, it was very important for me to include artists' words and for artists to talk about the making of in their own language. They, those texts were very, they weren't edited. I mean, if, and they were rough raw and they had the texture of those translations. We, obviously a lot of them don't speak English as their native language. So it was about the making of it. It was a very sincere um, attempt to really get artists to speak in their own words about the making and images of the making of. It also includes from my side a reflection on the making of and that incredible journey that I experienced in Taiwan, the incredible warmth of the Taiwanese people who embraced me um, so openly and shared their culture with me, the wonderful discovery of tea culture, Taiwanese tea culture, and, and the rich diversity of cultural life in Taiwan. There was the catalog, which you would have also seen downstairs, a very large edition with substantial essays and substantial analyses of works. The museum created a website. There's also a film on that website. Um, it's just not impossible for one person to manage everything and be everywhere. So. Elizabeth came in um, as the consultant on Zulu pottery and helped with texts and organizing and curating the Zulu pots or in the preliminary phase. Um, we had this international conference you saw in the pictures, which lasted two or three days, followed by a cultural tour, and there's also conference proceedings. So a very large, large and a very ambitious project um, managed on a very tight budget by a very capable museum. So the aims were really to facilitate a dialogue um, with global art and design histories, to celebrate the past, critically examine the present, and really to look forward to this future. Uh, the Biennale aimed to look at hot, what we could call hotspots in the international design and um, art arena, notably all these new technologies, and as I mentioned, uh, this question of the expanded field. So, um, what, did, what did 
do I feel it was characterized by, I think it wasn't, I hope it was an original proposal, the jury thought it was, um, with, a, with artists that had never been shown in Taiwan. Um, I downloaded all previous biennials in well, catalogues and did an extensive research about who had been shown in previous biennials in Taiwan and in Korea, and it was my aim really to present a complete fresh batch of young artists, mature artists as well, um, who had never been shown in the region. Um, and uh, and um, there's obviously, I'm, I'm an art historian, so there's a sort of question of academic rigor in terms of the essays and the scholarly content. One of the best practices for me is working collaboratively with Jaha and looking at these um, collaborative practices and networks. One of the key aspects of the Biennale was the, is the last point, this question of social diversity and demographic sensibility. I'm a South African, I, I lived through apartheid and one cannot curate as a South African without putting these questions on the table up front and being very direct about them. So, um, this really has shaped my curatorial practice. So there's a real sensitivity towards um, questions of race, gender, religion, and specifically in terms of this project being a large international project, um, the geographical um, balance between different regions. I noted, for example, that Taiwan and, and certainly East Asia has very little exposure to artists from Latin America. <coughs> And African artists are also completely excluded from these biennales, or they just don't feature um, in these biennales, or very, very little. So um, those were kind of key constituencies that I, that I felt um, I had to address, or key issues that I needed to address. Within Taiwan, um, Xu Ling mentioned there's this question of the regional East Asian balance and finding that balance between Japan, Taiwan, Korea, and China. Very sensitive questions in the region. One has to be very respectful to, to these um, issues. And um, the question of Taiwan, th there's a real lack of visibility of Taiwanese, specifically young Taiwanese artists on the international ceramic circuit. Um, a lot of them don't speak good English or have English websites or blogs. So it's, it's quite difficult to, to access young Taiwanese artists as someone in my position, as, as somebody living between Europe and South Africa. So um, the, 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 uh, that's really the, the reason for the collaboration with Jaha, who, who knows the whole young Taiwanese generation very well. Um, the, there were four themes in the Biennale. The first one was global identities, and, and that was, everybody knows the word global. Yes? Yeah, great. Um, and within this global identities, no, no, no. okay, it's so easy. Two minutes left, oh gosh. Global <laughs> and local, okay, global, okay. Shattered, upcycled, recycled, um, 3D and CNC, so CNC milling, um, and which is, is like a lathe, um, and digital materialities, and digital materialities, um, just to define that, is the, it's looking at the way that digital tools, technologies, and networks have mediated our social being, our social relationships, um, and, and how that's really changed our, our lives. So some of these pieces in the digital materialities included digital technology, but some of them didn't. Uh, and now, here we go, I'm on time. <laughs> Jaha, it's over to you. Oh, okay, good afternoon, everyone. Well, my name is Jaha, I'm from Taiwan. And well, this morning I was sitting in the theater and I just uh, thinking, uh, the first time when I was in Canberra was in 2005. And it was 10 years ago. And I, I was here for learning uh, study language in the language school. And at that time, I cannot finish one sentence. And now I'm here. <laughs> 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 uh, well, 
So I graduated from the Sydney College of Law and uh, uh, in 2009 uh, with my PhD and under the uh, Mr. Jody's uh, supervision. And uh, now I, uh, well, after that, back to Taiwan, and now I teaching ceramics at the National Taiwan University of Art. Uh, and also, this time I also bring my students to here and they very enjoy uh, to participate in the, uh, this event. Okay, now in my part, I will simply uh, introduce uh, seven Taiwanese artists. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I'm very uh, pleased uh, to be invited to help Wendy uh, in the section of the shelter and uh, upcycle and uh, recycle in TCB. And this is uh, the images shows uh, Wendy have a talk at my university. Uh, she shared the idea with the, uh, all the students and also artists, and also described how he organized the uh, BNA. And this image shows the opening at Inga Ceramy Museum. We had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, firstly, uh, well, in, in, in this section, there are seven Taiwanese artists uh, have a show uh, in this section. And uh, this work is made by two artists, uh, Lu Qixiang and Yi Hui Wang. And this work is all about the environment issue. Well, okay. Uh, this work shows a serious uh, environment issue in Taiwan, which is about uh, reservoir accumulation. And this work shows the process from the recycle, uh, recycle silt, uh, from the uh, recycle silt from the cement uh, uh, reservoir. And then the artist just uh, collect all the silt from the uh, reservoir and uh, uh, create a new glazes. And this is the process. So. And also, this project also supported by the National uh, Council and for funding. Jaha, I'm going to yeah. interrupt you. So, those four cylinders, the first one has a photograph. Do you want to explain what's in the four cylinders? Five cylinders. Five, five. Okay. Yes? Hmm? Do you want to explain what's in the four cylinders? Okay, five. yes. Five. 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 five, thank yeah. you. Well, uh, <laughs> and right the images, and this image just, just uh, we talk, we, uh, they took the photo. From the uh, from the cement uh, reservoir, and then and the second one is the artists they just clean the uh, silt from the from the reservoir, and then will it take long time and a very hard job, and then at the middle is uh, how to say that lufa and then, yes yeah, lufa and uh, the artists just use the lufa as the uh, filter, and then uh, just dip it in the in the in the slip. And then, and then make it work. And then uh, both is just the clean water. And then the finally is uh, the object you, you, you show, uh, they use the, the grace, they create the grace and they make it work. Mm. So just uh, from, from right to left is the process. Okay, this is another uh, very experienced uh, Taiwan artist. Uh, his name is Li Jingsen. Uh, this work is about his uh, life memory and the experience from past to present. And he collected many objects like toys or tools uh, from different times to represent his own history as timeline. And another uh, young Taiwanese artist, uh, Cai Ziyong. Uh, he is uh, currently he is doing an MFA degree uh, at my university. And this work is about the social issue of right of habitation in Taiwan. He tried to balance. He tried to find out the balance between uh, resident, re uh, resident and the government policies. Uh, one side, as you can see, one side is a broken pieces from, uh, from. From architecture, and the other side is black box, it, and it shows the uh, something, uh, well, shows the government policy, just uh, 
behind uh, in, in this black box, just uh, to represent the government policies. And this artist, uh, his name is Chen Gaoden. Actually, he is uh, not a ceramic artist. He is a jeweler. He is a jeweler, a jewelry designer. And uh, he is very uh, he is interested in the uh, to collect the old object, old ceramics object from secondhand uh, market, and then to remain uh, to to remain the world. So, in this world, he developed develop his mending uh, idea from fixing part. Uh, Xu Mingxiang, uh, she is a, female, a famous female artist in Taiwan, and also she lived in a local, uh, I mean Inga, Inga local artist. Uh, she has been spent long time in making uh, the topic of the traditional architecture and in this work, he made the uh, southlands of the roof tiles to connect old and new. And he wanted to connect the old, architect old and new architecture in Taiwan. And last one uh, is the artist, Hong Saoxiang. Uh, he is also a graduate from Sydney College of Arts, and he is my good friend. And uh, he back to Taiwan. Now he is an elementary school teacher, art teacher. And in this world, uh, he collect the uh, children's uh, uniform as a material to create his own work. And this work rep just represent the Taiwan education system and the uh, culture and identity, identity, and also his own memory. Okay, so well, this is my last question. Okay. Okay, in short, <laughs> uh, these uh, seven Taiwanese artists just show their own journey about time, about space, and environment, and also material, and also cultural aspect. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jiaha. Um, We've now seen seven of the Taiwanese artists. We're going to move on and look at another group of special artists, our Zulu potters that Elizabeth um, coordinated within the Biennale. Okay, over to Elizabeth. Well, thank you. And um, I'm happy also to be having a homecoming of sorts. Um, this is my second time at the Australian uh, Ceramics Triennale. I was here six years ago um, in Sydney, presenting with Moira Vincentelli um, and a, a panel about women artists globally. Um, and um, today I'm thinking and speaking about my experience as a consultant with TCB, which is very privileged. Thank you so much to Wendy, um, to Xu Ling, to the whole team at Inga. And um, it brought the question to me of, what does the Biennale like this mean for South African artists, specifically for um, Zulu potters? Uh, I've been studying Zulu ceramics for over a decade. I speak Zulu, um, long story there, but uh, what are Zulu ceramics? What do they look like, uh, traditionally it's speaking? Um, just a very quick introduction. Um, in 1816, the accession of uh, accession, sorry, of Shaka Zulu to the throne of the Zulu kingdom or empire took place. Um, and these are some much later pictures of um, Zulu brewing pots for beer um, with some of uh, one of the Zulu king's wives. And also an image, um, a hardboard print um, that was done in the 1950s, really when the what I think of now as the canon of Zulu ceramics was established during the apartheid period. There's a very interesting thing that happens to a lot of indigenous ceramics around the world, where as soon as they become kind of something to be studied, they get refined down. The diversity um, shrinks within what is expected, what is seen in the public eye. And this illustration became so iconic during the apartheid period and after that 
many museums now still seek out this specific pattern on Zulu wares. So something about the Biennale was to show diversity within this indigenous tradition. This picture became the iconic picture in a Zulu-only, Zulu-language handbook about the arts, but it was actually done by a gentleman who excelled within the apartheid um, administrative structure um, edu in the education system, and his entire job was to define what is Zulu so that one could divide and conquer. So it was, it's a very ironic thing that happens um, sometimes with, within the study and promotion later of, of an indigenous tradition, because this image was used into the 90s and 2000s as the promotional image for Zulu pottery. So, yeah, history is very complicated, right? Um, so this is an image of a contemporary Zulu potter who um, allowed me to go to one of his family festivities um, where he was bringing his father's spirit home in Ukubuyisa Iglozi. Um, a bringing home ceremony. Um, and he went and bought a pot from the streets uh, because he felt it was more authentic. So and that, again, very complicated history about what is a Zulu pot. These are hand-built ceramics, um, coil-built, just a quick kind of diagram here. <coughs> Thankfully, it's a bunch of ceramists and potters here, so you can kind of look <coughs> over it. Can you do that? No. That's okay. Um, so working from working the clay, um, kneading the clay, um, creating coils and building, this is a very small piece, um, smoothing the coils out, um, rubbing initially with a stone, and then there would usually be a second, sometimes a second burnishing um, prior to firing, and then a quick outdoor firing, um, and then treating the pots often with oils um, afterwards to bring out the shine of the burnish. Okay, now here it is at TCB. Um, the ta Taiwan Ceramics Biennale in front of some beautiful um, paper clay, mm -hmm. um, ceramics, paper porcelain, yeah. por porcelain. Yeah. so beautiful. Um, and I think the contrast was very striking to many people, the black and the white, um, the delicacy versus the gravity of the, of the Zulu pieces, but there was an active translation that had to be done in the presentation that was handled very sensitively. These pots, historically, would be seen on the ground, created by a potter sitting on the ground. And so the visual image of the pattern from above is extremely important. So what, what was done was to create two shells. One, to create an act of translation of rising up this indigenous tradition to the level of you know, fine art, trying to take it seriously um, as, as a beautiful, well-crafted object, yes? But then the other, trying to understand how to display something in a museum setting so that one could get multiple angles on an object that's supposed to be seen from above as well as from the side. Um, so I thought that was handled very well. We talked about it quite a bit, <laughs> so I thought I'd point that out. Um, it was a very interesting moment also how to get the ceramics. Um, it's not easy to go out into rural KwaZulu-Natal to acquire objects. Um, I don't know if I should say, but... So all of these were sitting in my garage. Um, <laughs> and through a very long set of circumstances, I have a very large collection of Zulu ceramics that I don't ever know what to do with for very moral and ethical reasons because I don't want to profit from the, from the um, ceramics that I study. Um, so it's very tricky how to build a career, but also build the career of the artists that I am so passionate about. Um, and that's one of the moral conundrums I find. Um, there are iconic Zulu artists, and we had one piece by Mesta Nala, who is one of the most iconic um, Zulu ceramic artists of kind of the contemporary Zulu ceramic tradition. She came to fame just as apartheid ended, as South Africa was seeking out uh, black South African artworks to rise up and put on a pedestal. Um, and I loved the reference yesterday to, uh, to Tanya Harrod's uh, keynote address where she said there is a myth of surrounding the idea of the unselfconscious potter working in folk traditions and Nestanala is exactly that person. <laughs> she was not self-conscious. 
of, um, or humble in that kind of, oh, you're just out there creating pots in the, you know, in the wilderness, in the rural feminine way. She was fully conscious that she was one of the best potters of her generation. Um, she traveled to the Smithsonian, to the International Folk Life Festival, and presented and represented South Africa. Um, and it's very useful now for Zulu ceramics, kind of internationally, to have that figure. But it's also dangerous because there is a, again, narrowing of the field. What is a Zulu pot is a very tricky thing now. Um, should they all look like a Nestanala? Or is there some indigenous surface treatment or subtlety to the tactility of the object that still needs to be respected rather than just seen on a plinth? And that's very difficult, as you all well know, to convey in museums where you can't touch, right? You just have to look. Um, some pre uh, kind of pre precedents have been set, thankfully, at the University of Johannesburg, where Wendy, is that's where you're? Yeah. Where her, um, um, what's it called? A research associate. Research associate status is. Um, and the plinths being low, again, to kind of convey the, the diversity um, and subtlety of surfaces and um, multiple devotees of um, Nestanala were shown there. Um, but there's also the kind of utility and danger. This has been experienced by many um, indigenous potters throughout the world. Um, Maria Martinez perhaps first experienced it the most widely, uh, being an innovator, uh, an experimenter, uh, you know, an amazing master of this art form, and yet being put in a box as a, an icon of rural authenticity, again and again, rather than a master. Um, so uh, I was just in Oaxaca, um, Mexico, at San Bartolo Coyotepec, um, two weeks ago, researching the car career of Doña Rosa, um, was Doña Rosa Real Ma Mateo, who also experienced the same process of being held up as the icon, and then in some ways locking in a tradition so people weren't sure where it should progress after that. Should it be stuck in the anthropological present? Um, should that rural authenticity always be demanded? Or is this a tradition that can expand? Um, this is the last couple of slides. But um, thankfully, there are expanding communities of potters working in a burnished flatware tradition. So here's somebody, um, Natombi Nala, burnishing a piece. Um, but there are also other potters. This is um, Ian Garrett, who was also in the exhibition, who did his MFA at the University of Peter Maritzburg. Um, in South Africa on Nestanala, who incorporates some of her aesthetic into his work, um, but then pushes it with other global influences in his own direction. He is a white South African, third or fourth generation, um, who struggles with his identity, but has embraced um, indigenous Zulu ceramics as uh, a national icon to be held up and emulated on his own terms. Um, likewise, the daughters of Nestanala continue her tradition um, and try to find their own path. And at least two, um, two of them were represented in TCB. Um, I'm here with Tembi Nala in Santa Fe um, in 2012. And just last summer, uh, Barbara Tahmohue uh, Gonzalez, who is the great granddaughter of Maria Martinez, um, had a Skype conversation. Uh, with Tembi Nala and Jabulile Nali, Nala um, and I <laughs> in Santa Fe and Durban, South Africa. And actually, um, at this very moment, um, Jabu Nala, her sister, is in Santa Fe um, and is showing at the International Folk Art Market. Um, as well, Andide Dialvani. The resident artist from TCB is there at the um, Contemporary Art Santa Fe Art Fair, um, showing a painting, actually. Um, and so I was impressed to see that these artists are converging um, on their own. Um, I was Jabu Nala and Barbara Gonzalez are trying to meet tomorrow. 
Um, and I love the fact that I could start a dialogue that in many ways is influenced by the international kind of tone set by the TCB, um, but then get artists together and then they go off on their own path. So um, hopefully there's sort of an artist to artist dialogue that is best practices um, that kind of came out of TCB. I think Andile is a part of that, but as well as the, um, the Nala sisters who are indigenous kind of <coughs> Zulu artists following this very strong tradition um, and launching their own international careers. So yeah. that's really wonderful. Thank you. I'm actually just going to follow on a little bit from Elizabeth and say other artists who, who were perhaps not known on the international scene but who are shown on that Biennale, um, their careers have taken huge steps. Um, you showed, uh, Ian Garrett was on the Biennale, he's just been uh, selected for a Smithsonian artist in, sorry, where is it? Uh, oh. There we go. Yeah, he's just been uh, selected for a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship. Um, Neil Brownsword, whose work we haven't shown, won the Career um, Gold Award at the Career Gyeonggi Biennale. Nice. And, nice. Grand, grand prize. He won. Yes, yes, yes. And the two. So Neil Brownsword, who was recruited by the Koreans and won their their gold award. Um, Francesco Adini, a young Italian whose work we will see, went on to uh, a couple of Chinese biennials, etc., etc., etc. I'm now going to call on Jane Milosh to talk about um, digital clay. Old Dogs, New Tricks. Um, she was one of the, the jurors, but she also has a long and faithful history in craft um, as the former uh, chief curator of the Renwick at the Smithsonian and is very well known to many of you in that capacity. Welcome, Jane. Thank you. Um, whoops. Did I just throw my PowerPoint over? Okay. You don't actually have to just... Is this the year? Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the organizers of the Australian uh, Triennale for allowing us to take the Taiwan Biennale experience on the road. And, you know, th this is actually the first time anything like this has ever happened for me. Usually kind of an exhibition happens. It's very exciting. There's a lot of energy. You get the catalog done. Show may travel. The, the catalog lives on. But something very special happened uh, for, from my perspective in Taipei. Again, it was my first time in Asia, um, and it was uh, quite an exciting experience to work as a juror with, um, a, it was a 50-50 situation of uh, Robert Bell from Australia, myself from uh, the U.S., and also Satsuko um, from Europe, something. and then three um, Taiwanese um, specialists. And that was a cultural process in itself as we were presented with these proposals to sort of pick what we thought would be a defining show. And the first thing that they seemed to bristle at, the Taiwanese, was the technology. Like it really, which really surprised me because I, you know, you, there's, you think, well at least we picked up many things in America, made in Taiwan, all of these technology things com coming from there but that the ceramics tradition was a very valued and old one falling you know, on the footsteps or together in a sense with China. So um, for me, when we came across Wendy's proposal, I was very excited not only because it um, was edging out there to really take uh, a temperature of what's being made and going on around the world, but also honoring these very ancient traditional ways of making ceramics. And I think that's gotta be one of the hardest things is to show something that seems um, archaic with something that is so high tech that it's basically not even there. That that experience is so transient, it's really about a performance or an installation. And so um, the show really brought that together. And um, so the process of the jury, but then the second um, thing that I thought was quite amazing was that for the opening they had this week long symposium, which you have again before, but Wendy actually assembled a group of artists that had never been brought together in a way that I had not seen as a curator in a long time. Um, so that in fact it became an encounter of 
artists working in the clay material in separate parts of the world, thinking about clay in very different ways, interacting. And that was a very contemporary experience. And in fact, you saw some of the photos. When I showed these photos of the artists back in Washington, D.C., they're like, why does everybody look so happy? <laughs> now, I don't know if it says something about how we are um, in D.C., uh, but it was really true. It was, everything was a discovery. So it was really um, a pleasure. So, so that's why I'm glad to be here, that we could come sort of rethink this. And I actually wrote out some remarks that I was going to talk about um, digital clay and technologies, and I'll go through that, but I'm not going to actually read this because I don't want to lose the energy that's come from my previous presenters and read a little academic thing. So I'll just sort of walk you through a few things and talk about the artwork. Um, the, the backstage that I'll say is, 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 again, all of us know in a way we're, we're already in a post-digital phase. So um, the fact that this is still uh, such a hot button for some people, like I said, in Taiwan for me was very interesting. Um, in 2008, MoMA had a show called Design and the Elastic Mind. That's already seven years ago. Um, uh, I was really pleased Tanya Harris showed Jeffrey Mann's work. And I remember when I first saw his work where he was discovering the flights of moths and birds and reinterpreting them in materials. Um, that movement was quite ethereal. Um, was a groundbreaking show. And the other show, um, Out of Hand, materializing the post-digital at the Museum of Art and Design in New York was another one. Those are two catalogs for anyone interested in this area, area you really should, should take a look at. Um, another one I want to mention is just closed in San Francisco called Data Clay, Digital Strategies for Parsing the Earth. And again, um, just seeing all of these resources come together for established and emerging um, artists, and it really parallels what's going on in the teaching of clay within the uh, genre of design, architecture, um, and, um, and how do you share this information, and this willingness to share. So I think that, to me, has been one of the um, telling aspects that also came out of the Biennale as I go through the, the slides, is I've always associated the craft community with that sharing technique, not afraid to share how you make things. You know, you wouldn't, walking into a painter's studio and saying, how do you paint, it, it's not going to happen quite the same way. So, um, to me, this digital thing is also a huge communication tool. So there, it takes the um, artist out of isolation. Um, I think the challenge many of us see is that um, it's a very luring technology still for a lot of us so that it becomes a distraction and off a reaction to what it can, what it can do. So while I say we're in this post-digital phase, I think it's still being worked out all of the potential um, different tools that it's bringing to, um, to the field of ceramics. So, and, and there's a wonderful website that went along with this. Did anyone see the show? I'm just kind of curious. Oh, yeah, there we go. So, so I was really sad it didn't travel, but again, a, a lot of this um, information is on, online. Um, I just also wanted to say when I, right before I went out to um, jury the show, I was at Rookwood Pottery in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I don't know if you, any have heard of Rookwood, but Rookwood is pretty much, pretty much what put ceramics, um, put America on the map in terms of ceramics when they won a prize at the Paris Universal Exhibition in 1898. Up until then, American ceramists were looked as sort of hobbyists and copycats, and um, that, uh, the, the workware that was produced there pretty much changed it, it was launched by a woman, on top of everything, and it was a very productive arts and crafts um, factor, product hand handmade um, uh, fabrication studio and so forth. And I was there um, because a donor recently purchased the old molds and reopened Rookwood Pottery. And the reason they were able to do this was that they were working with people from Alfred University to help recast um, molds that had been lost, so using digital technology to recreate the molds. And um, it was an amazing thing in that the owners are giving the pottery, the Rookwood pottery, back to the people who are working there. And so you have everybody just coming, young people from Cincinnati who were not even at art school, who were being trained how to make clay, um, how to spray booth, all the press discs. So there's this generational transition going on. And I just love it when you can think something can't be rejuvenated. Um, so I, 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 Alfred is still one of those places where um, people go 
a lot of the people who were out there had gone and done some kind of workshop or training. Wendy's show was really interesting. She sort of broke down the digital world into sort of two categories, 3D printing ceramics. Um, and I'm going to just look at two um, unfold. We've heard about them, I think, from a couple of speakers, Dries Verbruggen and Claire Fournier. And um, their digital wheel uh, was, was quite the hit with um, the number of people who attended the Biennale. And Robert, Robert was telling me yesterday that you know, even the youngest person walked into this digital wheel and knew what to do while I didn't know what to do. You know, some <laughs> that, that this familiarity with the material. Um, and so if any of you have seen this, you can throw a pod, if the, the, your movements are recorded. Um, various designs were then, the last number of designs are then projected on the wall and they can eventually be printed out. But a very interactive uh, way of um, drawing people in. People who maybe never thought I could throw on a wheel, but this sort of becomes an entrance into to the work. So it was very exciting. Um, and then they did a residency in the community. So it was very fascinating. So they worked with a lot of students there and um, using a 3D technology. Francois Bramont and Sonia Loger also had one of the residencies. I really encourage you to go to Taiwan. I, I, it was like going to Ceramics Disneyland, for any of you who like <laughs> ceramics. Um, there isn't a little train that drives you around, but there could be. Oh wait, no, there is a train. Isn't there like a little thing that goes around? Because they have this amazing uh, studio workshop, and the, just the number of visitors that we saw there alone in a week, school groups, um, every generation um, there. 650,000, over 650,000 visitors in four months. I mean, that's months. just absolutely it's like astonishing. Yeah. So Francois was one of the artists uh, that had a residency there, and his medium is, is actually writing code. But he teamed up with um, one of the potters. I'm not gonna the master. The master Truth. potter. Yeah. It's the uh, Chan 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 Bo Xiang. Right. And, oh yeah, here's the, here's the picture here. He, he met, up, he stole a pot. Yeah, yes. it, it was exciting. So pot. he used a camera to um, record the movements and motions of him throwing the pots. And yet the two of them were looking back and forth. So it wasn't just one looking at the throwing <laughs> or the machine, the camera recording it. It became this exchange between someone who wants to capture those movements and gestures and the material in the code, and the other thinking, how are my materials, gestures being interpreted in this other form? So a lot of this was recorded, and then you could actually print out and make your own kind of dinnerware. So again, very interactive. But um, I thought it was really bold of him to be you know, ceramic dust and all this high tech. These are not things that easily go together. I'm sure if any of you have that digital, you basically need two studios from what I've seen. One that's very clean, <laughs> that can uh, handle that kind of stuff. And so, um, and the, the second area that she had was cyber ceramics and digital materialities, where it was very much more experiential in the sensory way, I would say. Um, sort of uh, sound, and we also had, um, this This is the artist Fran Francesco Ardini. I thought it was very interesting. Francesco Ardini um, did not train in ceramics, but was drawn to <coughs> s s workshops in the Deruta area of Italy, and all of these um, blanks that were sitting around, and he just started talking to the um, master ceramic artists there, and they were intrigued by his interest, and so he began designing and creating these sculptures, and here he's using the iPad in animation um, and painting certain metallic uh, things on his the surfaces. Anyways, again, this interactive of how things change with the screen and the tablet um, uh, was pretty amazing. So you see the plate on the wall, and then you could move it around. And you know, in some ways, you, one could say, well, what, what's the point of that? But there is a sense of mystery beyond um, the decoration and the, the animation that um, was really compelling. So um, it was that that area was always crowded um, with with visitors engaging in the material. Eugene Hahn from South Africa. I found an, another wonderful example of using very traditional ballpoint pen drawings as illustration, heavy decoration onto these um, porcelain ceramic duck decoys, essentially, and then projecting. Um, these drawings as animations that were moving with music. Um, it was really quite beautiful because the, the mo movement of the water and the sound and the uh, decoration, a new twist on looking at some of the traditional decorating techniques. 
two um, pieces that dealt with ceramic and sound, Nicola Boccini and Pier Luigi Pompei. Um, Nicola also in the Deruda area um, began working with engineers and putting in uh, various um, wires and, and oxides so that when you're at the wall, it, they react to both sound and um, sound and also touch. So again, this sort of warmth and you know another way of looking at um, play it was really quite lovely. Pier Luigi with the horns um, was in a darkened room. If any of you have ever seen those ancient Roman horns, you always wonder what they sound like. This had a beautiful recording, and again, um, I think for a lot of the visitors, it was the first time they were having this kind of installation experience with clay and, and the sound of clay. And then finally, Pick McManus, who we're so glad is here, um, her use of um, video production and HD video um, and this disintegration of this boat, um, this, piece, this piece based on boat people in Australia called In the Night Vessel, um, was also quite magical um, in the sense that I think her years of working in clay really influenced how she used the medium, uh, the, the videography medium of uh, time-lapse photography, sound, um, just the, the process of decay and rejuvenation um, was really quite exciting. So that's just a quick overview of some of the digital ceramic pieces that were in the show. Wow, I feel like we've been through a marathon. We're spot on time. Um, can I field questions? Are there any questions? Uh, perhaps I can also say the, the catalogs. I've, well, I've got five videos here. If anybody would like one, they, they're going free. Um, if anybody found Elizabeth's Zulu Pottery book, please do return it downstairs. <laughs> And the catalog and, and the handbook are downstairs. No, 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 um, online. You can watch and the online. entire catalog, the film. The catalog and film and everything's online. If, if you can't find it, because sometimes the Yingye website's a little bit difficult to navigate, you look for me on academia.edu and I've got the catalog, I should be saying this, but I've got the catalog on my academia.edu as well as the handbook as PDF, so they can also be downloaded there if you can't find them on the Yingye site. Um, are there any other, or are there questions? I, I have a question yes. for um, Shuling. Huh? Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, what, what, what well, let's let's everybody come up. Maybe we should do that. Come, yeah. Robert, and you can yeah, host. Answer questions. Um, can, Jenny? Oh, okay. Let's, let's go here. Come on. Okay. <laughs> well, then Pip has to come up here. And there's Kevin over there. Kevin was our opening speaker. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks for coming. Okay. We just like being together again, too. So. <laughs> Kevin, should you yeah. Yeah. Kevin, you were there. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Bring a chair. Part of the whole experience. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> he's our speaker of a conference. He was our keynote speaker. Speaker of the conference. Was what was what was the uh, the impact of, of the tree of the biennial on the, on, you know, on on Taiwan? I mean, you, you had a million visitors. Is that what yeah. I understood? Yeah. Over a million visitors. Six fifty. Six fifty. Six fifty. Yeah. So uh, clearly a hugely important uh, exhibition for Taipei. But what what do you think the impact has been on not only local ceramics but also on the attitude towards Digital, you know, digital uh, technologies, you know, within Taiwan's, you know, really uh, expanding um, manufacturing industry. Uh, until now, I, I couldn't, I couldn't say it had an impact, uh, had impact on our ceramics uh, industry. But uh, for me, uh, I heard from some friends. Basically, uh, our, how can I say, it's the first time we have uh, so much uh, ceramic work related to technology in Taiwan. And so, uh, some, uh, it, it attracts some people 
especially contemporary celeb artists who come to our museum to see the exhibition. And they will say, oh, yes, our uh, third the map in the contemporary way as the main impact for Chinese, for Chinese artists. Also, in fact, our artists who could collaborate with even especially celeb artists who could collaborate with different kinds of material or new technologies for ceramics. I think that's a main impact for our our ceramics field. Yeah. But not really, uh, but we, we even discussed about how to operate. For example, the 3D printing technique in our uh, ceramic industry. But it seems a lot of uh, problems we have to solve. Yeah. No. It's not very easy to be a kind of uh, towards the product for our for our celebrity now. Yeah. Surely, may I say that with or without the piano already, with or without you have one million visitors. Uh, you <laughs> have all... <laughs> people come by buses from all over, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's in, the, in, the, in the culture in Taiwan yeah. to come to Yinge Museum. Yeah. If there is a Biennale yes. or yeah. not a Biennale. Mm -hmm. So I think the question will be tricky because you never see results immediately. Uh, yeah, it takes it, time it's, to yes. it's impossible to see immediately. Yes. We, we never know. We put a stone in the, the water, but we don't know <laughs> if there will, at least there will be some waves, but we don't know how big and how long. And we, 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 right. don't, we cannot measure uh, the impact. But of after the Biennale, uh, I get some information from everywhere. They want to know 3D printing. Yeah, they want to know how to operate 3D printing, maybe in uh, um, ceramics. But it's there, I ever had a discussion with our, anyway, uh, the, the factory or our, our academic institute about this. But yeah, anyway, it still has a lot of problems to solve, as I, I mentioned before. But I think it, the, the impress is, is just uh, continuous. Yeah, so <coughs> it's a type to observe. Yeah, I, I, I want to follow up on Shark's comment because I agree. Um, it was amazing from a museum perspective to see so many school kids going through at an early age, not only walking through historical ceramics, the technology, then they also go and make something. I mean, if this were to happen in New York or DC or I mean, it's, you know, even in small regional museums, to see that heavy of a focus on ceramics, I've, not, I've never seen anything so um, intense. Well, I think it's only a credit to the Indian Museum's educational program, oh, which has you know, fabulous programs for toddlers and right yeah. yeah. the way through, and there's a real yeah. loyalty and a real engagement. To one with, medium. With to community. One medium. Mm -hmm. We have a different types of, of uh, educational events for our audience. Uh, for example, for kids, for professional uh, professor, professor or something like that. So. Can I bring up something which um, is a connection with the discussion this morning? Because I think uh, one of the extraordinary elements in, in the Biennale uh, in Taiwan, uh, as well as the technology, was uh, connecting with Africa. And obviously, Wendy mm -hmm. and Elizabeth, that is uh, part of your expertise, but uh, as we saw this morning, um, there's always been a, a great engagement in, in folk ceramics, folk potters. Uh, say, for instance, Sandra Balkett's presentation, her collaboration, long collaboration with uh, uh, artisan <coughs> potters in India. Um, and I, I just interested to think in terms of the Biennale framework, mm -hmm. uh, one of the dangers, of course, in terms of, say, gathering artisans, putting them in the museum, is that uh, you recreate something which is sort of ethnographic. It's about uh, uh, something which is, puts them up forward as some sort of exotic display in the vein of uh, museums, exhibitions, world exhibitions of the past. But uh, um, how do you think, uh, in terms of the reflection of the experience in the residencies and so on, uh, it's, it's possible for Biennales to engage with the kind of the world of the folk <coughs> which is um, particularly important. Well, point, but, uh, so I think that actually this is a, a point that I've, I've thought about quite a bit. And in the visual presentation, I think there was a very elegant solution in giving an equal grounds to 
indigenous ceramics and, and kind of a folk ceramics movement as a highly refined aesthetic um, expression. Um, but then there's a difficulty and, and a, a, a very dramatic expense, actually, that ends up happening. We, to have one of the Zulu potters come who has limited English fluency <coughs> would have been much more of a challenge because then a translator, a fluent translator, needs to be in place you know, at all times um, for that to be a respectful and, and fruitful experience. Um, and that's something that's, that, that I see happening in uh, Santa Fe, for instance, just now, right now, literally as we're speaking, Jabunala is in Santa Fe at the International Folk Art Market. They can't find translators, and there have been some very uneven experiences of some indigenous potters in, in an environment like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas Andile Delvane is a you know, art school trained, mm -hmm. highly educated male, um, South African, who's black, um, but to say that he's kind of a folk art artist, Completely off the table. <laughs> but, 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 he's, but he's very influenced by, still by those writers. Right. He is, he is, he is, he is, 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 is influenced yeah, by them. But he understands that that's part of his recipe. Oh, yeah. That, right. that, I mean, and I think that's and the fact that he had the residency at the same time with someone like Francois Bourbon, who was writing in code, also working with that potter, seeing the two of them interact was absolutely fascinating. Right. How they were asking questions and, and he, Basically, he was teaching Francois also about pottery and ceramics. Right. So there was no boundary of like, if this is the folk, or this, he's a South African male of this tradition. You know, there wasn't, that barrier was gone from what I could see in that residency program, which I think has got to be very hard to achieve. But Taiwan became that neutral ground. But I think there's also a thing that the digital divide is very much in place, and Anzile is on one side of that divide. And it is a divide that is completely connected. And he's, you know, on Facebook every day, and he's posting his images, and he's, he's, he's super like savvy, most, right? Yeah. Where and so, whereas yeah. the artist that I'm working with, actually, um, Tembi Nala is on Facebook, and okay. that is how I communicate fairly regularly with her. And she actually is going to be in New York. The Department of Arts and Industry in South Africa is sending her, but she's very nervous about being on the ground in New York. You know, once she gets there. And so it's, it's, it's the thing, it's going to have to be generational. And that's why I was so happy to connect Maria Martina, or Maria, oh, sorry, um, Barbara Gonzalez, Maria Martinez's great granddaughter, with the Nala sisters. And it was very much a moment where you felt like there was a, a, a maternal in, kind of impulse that happened, where she was giving recommendations mm -hmm. to how to na navigate in this international art world. And so I think that's the thing. It, it has to be, there's a generational shift that will occur with being a part, even visually, of, an, of a Biennale like this is a step in the right direction. And then that can go on the CV of the artist that's in the New York, you know, that is going to be in New York in August. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, but it's a, it's a tough negotiation because I think the digital divide, people forget it still exists. Because if somebody has a cell phone in the middle of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa, they think that they have access to everything, but it's still not quite there. Can I just uh, interject that I think, and what's interesting that you brought up is about language, mm -hmm. and to bring that Zulu ceramics, quite a, you needed um, a very competent translator. Mm -hmm. And I think the language issue is a really important global issue that language, local language, is almost treated as, as a folkloric eccentricity, which we don't have to deal with because our language, because English is so dominant. Mm -hmm. And at the Vietnam, we all communicate in, mm -hmm. in English. But language is our culture. No, but remember we did yeah. have a, a whole Taiwanese audience, we did have a Chinese Absolutely. You did, you, there was some Korean yes. translation at times, Japanese. and there was Japanese. I was very impressed times. with the young um, presentations, um, and that, yes. I was going to say, mm -hmm. that was taken off very, very uh, seriously. But in most parts of the world, I don't know that it's <coughs> the dominance of English is assumed um, to a large degree that, you know, if you travel somewhere and you don't have a translator, oh, what's tough, 
Uh, maybe I can even come to that. I, I found just in the whole curatorial process, um, people are obviously, anybody's much happier in their home language. And I, I, I'm very fortunate living in France so I can speak French and previously I lived in Spain so I, could, I can speak Dutch, Spanish, uh, etc. So I mean, that was really helpful because we had lots of problems uh, negotiating with Francois over certain issues and it was just really easy to reassure him in French and just like go through everything in French and then translate it all back to English for, for the times. And, I mean, he speaks good, good enough, but, but when, it comes, when, when you're in a comfortable zone, it's always a little bit yeah, easier to have your home language. That's right. And we had some yeah, big I want to congratulate yeah, the English for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but the master Jungle Jungle could not speak any uh, English anymore, but he just used five language to communicate with. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. like on delay and uh, and the phone from 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 with five language, mm -hmm. they can communicate very well. Yeah, so that's just, yeah, yeah. That's what we saw in the studio. Language is not a problem. <laughs> okay. No, I mean, that, that's what was amazing. Well, I, I, I thought, I mean, maybe in the preparation, but I mean, I guess that's the thing is, you know, if you try to force something, it's not going to be very fluid. I mean, you can only set up the structure and people may want things, but what I saw, and again, once these artists and their studios coming from their traditions, there was a fluidity. Yeah, exactly. So, Jacques, I think there was another question somewhere. Can we take the other question and come back to you? There was somebody over there with a hand up. Maybe they left. Okay, maybe they left. <laughs> Excuse you, Jack. Off we go. So the goal was not to interrupt your fine discussion about <laughs> the languages, which is fine. But I, I had the chance to be in Inge at the same time you were organizing this exhibition, telling us everything. And uh, I met Francois Brumont, we met the big friend, I met uh, the. And Dile, we become friends. So I see everything works very well. So my point is difficult to express which is about the Zulu question. <laughs> uh, this is very delicate. I, I, I think I'm working on eggs now. <laughs> uh, my experience in Africa, which is uh, 30 and more years now, mm -hmm. in a country where there is no spot, no light on it, which was Rwanda. And I was engaged for a two and th or three years uh, project to work really in the countryside, not with institution, museum, really with the local people. And very often, so we have imported some, some tools. And my thinking was to import as little technology as possible, so not to have big jump. And uh, before going to this uh, place, I was having trained one month about multicultural communication and understanding and uh, I don't want to make too long, but one African guy who was one of the trainers said, if you are going to be in a good project, means good that you are going to have positive effect on the local community. Anyway, you are going to disturb the local situation. And this is a problem. And if you are not, if you are going to be in a not so good project, it can very often happen. Anyway, you are going to spend money and make connection between people so that will have good effects as well. So there is no bad, no good. But my point is, I also uh, noticed that in Santa Fe, uh, in, in 2012 we have our meeting in Santa Fe, that uh, of course when we put the light on some traditions that become to market, it changes the tradition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It, it, of course, it cannot stay as it was because it becomes market. Mm -hmm. And my feeling, excuse me, this, I, I will be horrible now. My feeling is that very, very, very high <coughs> prices were not only about the quality of the work, but also about the guilty of the people. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so we are buying our. Guilt exists, guilt, guilty feelings, you know, about what has been done to the native Indian people. So I, at the same time, I'm happy that for the local people, it's a big amount of money coming and being distributed to the community. And at the same time, we have not to be romantic about this uh, society. No society is stable. And we are going to introduce some changes, and we are responsible for the changes, and that's it. So. I think it is good. 
I really appreciate the picture with the white and the black. It's, well, when I say it's the white and the black, it's just exactly this. But in fact, it is always double-sided. Mm. It's all what I wanted to say. Well, and actually, if I might discuss, just since it's a room full of people who love play, this is a perfect moment. So Wendy and I had this big discussion. So there was kind of this rapid selection process that had to take place in picking the Zulu pots that would be part of the exhibition. And I only noticed in retrospect that it was the more um, potters who've been working for the market for decades and people who had a much more refined um, kind of burnish technique that were selected. Mm -hmm. But it was sort of after the fact, looking at the pieces that weren't selected, um, realizing that there was an act of translation in the aesthetic selection process. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I'm trying to get at, and I've been trying to speak to um, people who use Zulu ceramics to drink beer, which is what they're for originally, to discuss what is the surface quality of a Zulu pot that's a used Zulu pot versus a viewed Zulu pot. And, and there was um, one um, <coughs> wonderful scholar, um, but who recently passed away from, from cancer, Juliet um, Armstrong, who spoke a great deal about, um, she actually published a statement saying that she, she was hesitant to <coughs> expose the artists she worked with to the market. My reaction is they've been selling to the market since the 1980s. So to, to treat someone as that naive was a very, um, Problematic, problematic. <laughs> like select words carefully. Um, very problematic statement for me because I believe very strongly in treating the artist as a sophisticated person who is working as a, as a potter and as someone selling. And I'm asked all the time to get to help sell, and I would say I can give you the names of as many galleries, and I can tell you my own personal opinions of those people. But it's your decision who you sell to and how you sell and what you change in your pots. That's, <coughs> that's, not, that's not my job. But at least an you break one very important thing. <coughs> this is a contribution of the Yinge Biennale. And maybe uh, uh, it, it, is, it will not have effect on Taiwan, but it will have effect on the global ceramic situation, which is, I was in Beijing uh, two months ago for the opening of the National Art Museum exhibition, you know, ceramic for people, very high. You know. <laughs> and the discussion afterwards was between East and West. And I was so boring, East, West, East, West. <laughs> so you break this taboo, which is South exists, and India exists, and you to be here, and many other countries, and we have to <coughs> enlarge. So thank you, Wendy, for this contribution. What we haven't seen in this presentation, and thank you very much, <coughs> it's very kind, is also this question of deindustrialization, which was addressed in the Biennale. I think, and that is a phenomenon that's that's happening all over the world, and, and is also being dealt with by artists. We've we've heard a little bit about it. I think it was a very rich Biennale. Um, it was very important to have those African artists. It was very important to have the Latin American. Um, contingent there, I think that that, that the, those were it was a very important forum <coughs> for those people to be at. But for me, I hope the legacy of the Biennale is is in a certain intellectual rigor, um, an intellectual rigor in terms of really saying what is important for us as a community internationally. And yes, it's local identities. It's valorizing north, south, east, west, and saying we all have these important histories that are equal and, and that deserve to be recognized and we can't just continually trap Africa in a certain aesthetic. That's why, you, that's why Eugene Hahn was there, Ian Garrett was there. These, these people working in very contemporary ways, perhaps with older traditions, with new traditions, etc. We can't trap people in ghettos and we all have the, these multiple traditions and these very rich heritages and I think, excuse me, for, but like um, themes, these sort of generic themes that we see <coughs> in Biennales, Orientalia, um, with us, communities with you, with us together, 
we see a lot of very poetic, very poetic, let's call it poetic themes for big exhibitions in ceramics. And you can just throw anything in there. And, and yes, it is a nice experience to go and see, and sort of then the curator just puts in a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this. And, oh, we haven't got figurative, so let's put a few figurative pieces in. Oh, why not a bit of technology? And there's no sort of theory and there's nothing to conceptually hang it together. Um, and, and that's, uh, and I'm sorry to, to take that for a while, but, but for me that's really what I hope is the legacy of this Biennale is, is perhaps just being a little bit more critically savvy and really thinking about what a Biennale is and who our community is, what is our history, where are we now, and, and hopefully where are we going tomorrow. I don't have all the answers, none of us have the answers, but, but it's just to, to move beyond the sort of generic um, sort of themes that, that, that really don't advance us as a community of clay-loving people. Wendy, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs>